we want to talk about the first time you got into entrepreneurship. When you left a well-paying job, when you had mortgages to pay and kids for whom you have to pay for school, and you decided to take the plunge. You know, it's very easy right now to think back and philosophically for any of us to say, hey, you know, I knew we are going to succeed. I knew I had it in me and, you know, stuff like that. We want to hear from you your real feelings. And I'll come to each of you in a minute with specific instances in your life. What exactly did you go through? What were your fears and trepidations? How did you overcome it? It can be family member support. It can be friend support. But something must have been there to keep you going. And we'll start with that. And we'll ask, you know, we'll get it a little bit more deep as we go along. And one specific thing which we want you to answer is, at some point of time, when you took the plunge for the first time, you must have felt, you know what, I did something wrong. I probably sort of stuck to that job, and my life could have been much more smooth and simple. How exactly did you overcome that? The first person we'd like to start is Jagdish. Um, and this is about the company Jariva. Is the right way to pronounce it? Mm -hmm. uh, it was, the year was 2000, if I'm correct, if I have looked at your... LinkedIn profile, which gives a lot of information. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you basically launched this company, leaving Hewlett Packard, and the company was acquired by Veritas Fuels down the line. We want to know from you what exactly were the things which motivated you, your fears, how did you overcome that when you moved from HP to Jariva, which was very, just a few years after your MS degree was over. Please, we'll start with you, Jagdish. So, <clears throat> so, first of all, when I started that, uh, just in terms of age, I was 29, so I didn't have any kids. Good. Uh, I was married, so uh, uh, there's always uh, uh, certain things that come with that phase. Um, but I think, uh, let's put it this way, I, I guess I was a little bit more brash then than, than I am right now, 11 years later, uh, just turned 40. So Congratulations. Uh, <laughs> so... Uh, it, it was a different time, and but uh, what were the motivations? I think um, for me, it's always been <coughs> about solving a particular problem that I've faced myself, and to the extent that I saw an opportunity in replicating that, right, solving that solution for a larger number of people. Uh, it, the genesis of Jariva was just that, um, you know, when I was back at uh, HP. Uh, I had a little bit of foray into entrepreneurship before that within the context of HP itself. Um, I, uh, I had an opportunity to uh, sort of work on an entrepreneurship role within the company itself. So I had the big safety net of a larger, a larger organization. Uh, so I had a little bit of, uh, um, of an introduction to that. It came about where specifically the problem, I was trying to solve that problem for HP at that time, not for the broader market. And the problem was related to shortage of computing resources. And this was, this was way before cloud was cloud, right? There was no such thing as cloud at that time. But uh, the, the concept was very straightforward. It was, um, HP was rolling out these 64-bit chips, which were the novel titanium, thing at yeah. that time, that time uh, PRS64, Itanium, and right, whatnot. Titanium. And there were a lot of software companies who partnered with HP who used to uh, uh, certify their uh, uh, ISP vendors who used to certify their software applications on these systems. But there was a huge shortage of these systems because they weren't all mass produced yet, right? So they were just still taping out the chips and there were limited amount of systems. But there was this mad rush to get all these ISP applications certified on day one, so to speak. So you have a chicken and egg problem, right? You have very few uh, systems that uh, you have available and uh, they're pretty high priced and most people couldn't afford it. So. The engineer in me, so uh, so to speak, you know, sort of put this crazy idea to somebody in HP, which I can't believe they bought it, but they bought it, uh, was that why don't you give me a bunch of these systems, and I put this iron curtain behind it, and I'll do whatever magic I need to do, but I will rent them compute capacity. So the concept of renting compute capacity was just a crazy idea at that time. People just sold hardware. Uh, they said, uh, but it would solve your big problem of issues with your partners where a lot of partners are asking you for these systems and you don't have access to them. So that was the opportunity, so to speak, right? So that, that's where it started. And so they had enough of a pressure from the partner community that they relented and they said, okay, go do this, right? So I went and did this. Turned out to be a big success and, <coughs> you know, sort of they rolled it back in and then they started to build this. And the genesis of Jariva came from there where 
they said you take this and run with this and now I was getting every month I was getting new systems and I was running this so now I'm an engineer turned a businessman so to speak right I'm running operational I'm putting in this operational role and when I look at operations um, there were one thing that struck me again was every time I was budgeting a system budgeting for every five systems I was also budgeting one person to actually manage all of those systems from an IT administration perspective because everything was so manual so I mean, clearly engineers, right, you start thinking about efficiencies, right? So it, something didn't make sense. So I said, there's got to be some way of automating this. It, this, this seems to be <coughs> too boring and, uh, and, and mundane. And so I figured, well, a lot of people up and down 101 might have the same problem because that was the time of the whole dot-com boom, right? There was uh, a, everybody in the valley was an ISP or an ASP or an MSP or whatever SP, right? So and everybody was building data centers. <coughs> So I went and talked to um, you know people at Exodus, people at AboveNet, people at you know all all the big names, and essentially everybody had the same problem except they didn't care. The VCs were bankrolling them. They said, "I don't, I don't, we don't care about that operational efficiency because our focus is on growth." So the genesis was just that. That where I saw I saw that if somebody would actually build an automation software to sort of focus on that cost aspect of it, there it could be. A big opportunity. Two things quickly. First of all, a uh, bunch of folks from VMware, they'll certainly agree with you that you did the right thing. <laughs> and by the way, just to let me know, when Diane and team was building VMware, I'm one of, I was one of their first beta testers. And my first round of VC funding was actually uh, secured after I did my demo purely on VMware VMs to illustrate that concept, not with their We knew we have to have something like VMware there. Thank so you. I, uh, big thanks and credit goes to them. Yeah, but one, one question before I move to Rajiv. I still remember, you started the company in 2000, and something struck my mind just now. 2001, August 4th, I was driving back from Vancouver to Portland, and I, dro I dropped by in Seattle to meet with a friend of mine from Microsoft, who was a junior of ours from IDBHU, who told me that Jagdeep has started a company, I won't give his name, uh, and he's not Raja. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, he was like, Jaggi started this company, you know, and the, well, the market crashed in 2001, right? It, it, was, it was a real, you know, bloodbath out here. Not sure what, what exactly, how it is going to really shape up. And the reason it is, and I exactly remember when he told me, I have that question for you, Jagdeep. The market crashed, the funding dried up, the whole, it looked like the whole dot-com boom is gone. And that time your company was not yet sold to Veritas. Yes. Tell me how exactly did it feel? How did you guys make it through in 2001? This happens a lot because if you think carefully or in a way, you know, it was a good timing, but the timing was changing. But it seems your idea was strong. Tell us a little bit about what exactly went through. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the first uh, seed round we did was uh, just after the market crash. So, I mean, I, I raised about 21 million in that business and all the rounds came in uh, pretty much during nuclear winter, so to speak. It was the hardest time to raise capital. Uh, and uh, you really needed to have something that's rock solid. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, so as a result, I probably must have gone through some, something like 300 VC pitches, and I've probably seen every possible term sheet you can see with every possible kind of leverage that can be put there, uh, multiple liquidation preferences, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's another topic. So any of you are interested, I can talk about that <laughs> later. Uh, but uh, net net, uh, going back to your question, uh, you know, the B round we, when we did was the worst because that's when the market really tanked in a big way. Uh, but in a weird way, uh, I think we were, uh, so we were going through the roller coaster, um, but I think in a weird way it actually helped us. And the way it helped us is because it hit everybody else the same way. And we actually started to turn that into an advantage for us because our central pitch basically became, look, up and down 101, there's all this money that's gone into these service providers, um, and everybody's focused on the cost, and here I have an aspirin for them. Exactly. Okay, and if you fund this, every service provider is gonna buy it. And to back that up, luckily, um, the very first order I got was actually from uh, AT&T, SBC, it used to be called SBC then, not AT&T. And they purchased the software for 26 of their cyber centers. It was a $350,000 order. I still have a copy of the check in my, uh, <laughs> in my office. And that basically was the validation that any VC was looking for. That essentially secured the, the funding because that model and that hypothesis, there was, a, there was a real validation for that. That, okay, if they could buy it, then you probably, if, if you have any Basically, you got a business model. So that's, that was the. Thank you. So uh, thanks a lot. Uh, 
before, uh, so let's move to Rajiv. So Rajiv, uh, your first company, which hit big, was in Grian Networks. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, you worked in engineering and product management and in different roles in companies like Sun. When you took the plunge for the first time, this was probably in 1990s, 2000? Right. Uh, same question, I won't repeat the same thing, but first of all, how was your personal situation a little bit different? And what motivated you, you know, what were your fears? What were your you know, dreams and how exactly you, know, you overcame it? We'll, we'll grill you a little bit more, but let's start with that. Sure. So, Indian Networks was founded in 2000. This is the dot-com boom time. I used to be at a company called Healthy on WebMD uh, at that time before I, before I jumped and started Indian. It used to be called Indian Systems when we started, but we ended up changing the name to Indian Networks. Uh, please don't ask me why, but we did. Uh, the genesis of why we started Indian Systems was something which, again, very similar to the experience which uh, Jagdish had. Uh, again, I'm going to speak a little bit of technical jargon here. If, if you don't understand this, please ignore, and <laughs> hopefully other things I say would make sense. You're so, challenging our technical merits well, here. <laughs> well, this is going to be very specific to SSL. So, yeah, that's fine. so when you go to a financial institution, uh, this is like you go and when you, when you try to do anything secure connection, this is way back in 2000 when secure connections, these SSL connections were essentially done on the CPU. And you could only do a handful of these RSS sig signatures on the CPU. So I was happened to be working with a professor from Wisconsin who was uh, related to somebody at Stanford, a professor from Stanford. And over dinner, I was describing this issue that you know, if there was a way, if we could speed up the number of handshakes you can do on a system, it would really help. And you have to remember, Healthion was a place which was funded by Jim Clark, Netscape. So this is, so you know, we were the, very early people using SSL, who SSL had come out of Netscape. And in that conversation with a professor from Stanford, we came up with a system where we could do a lot many more handshakes on a system than a normal CPU could do, or then there were some vendors who were beginning to do crypto cards, where you could do these RSA signatures on those crypto cards. But with our scheme, we could do more signatures. I was not married. I was single. Uh, Lucky you. Uh, and look, the notion of risk or thinking about what's going to happen to my paycheck never even came into uh, the thought process. Uh, because 2000, you saw so many companies were getting born. You had a good idea. We were you know, the professor from Stanford, myself, we were completely in agreement that this was the right thing to do, and we started the company. Uh, but the journey there was different than what happened to Jagdish. I ended up leaving that company in 2002. We didn't have a CEO, so I was VP of engineering and CTO, and the professor was, uh, I think his title was chief scientist. So we had an interim CEO, we got a new CEO, and I, the CEO we hired, so we actually raised money, two rounds of funding, but ultimately I decided to leave the company and founded Neopath Networks, where I was the founding CEO, and we raised Series A in that nuclear winter, which you just heard from, uh, which everybody knows, the dot-com bust. That was a very hard fundraise. And again, this is, I think I was just talking to somebody earlier here, it's hard to describe once you, once you start doing something on your own and you realize, okay, for me it was, it's the hard part of doing a startup is figuring out what to solve. I think given our backgrounds, once you know the problem you want to solve, there's enough brain power to work and figure out a solution. Like Ingrian, you know, figuring out that was a problem we wanted to go and attack. That became the genesis of the company. Same thing with Neopod. So once you have this thesis that you have something which you want to solve, and of course you want to get some validation. So surprisingly, I'm going to point out at a person here, 
when we were starting Neopath Networks, Kimberly here, who I'm meeting after a few years, she used to be at Broadcom. If you, if you remember, we actually, I don't know how we got connected. Somebody, a mutual friend made the connection. Broadcom. You, you were at Broadcom, a mutual friend made the connection. So I actually went to Broadcom. That's when I met Kimberly and pitched the idea, a PowerPoint. If we had this, would you buy? And the conversations continued. We did that with some other uh, companies too. And that led to Series F funding. So one thing is, unfortunately or fortunately, I'm a systems person. So to build systems product, you do need capital. So it's, you know, the, the models are changing these days. But if you're trying to do something in system, we could not write a prototype. We, it was all PowerPoint. And Cloud Velox is also, we started the company with a PowerPoint. Then you go build the product. So you were our beta customer after we built the product. So the genesis Perfect. is, that makes like sense. you have to figure out if there's a problem which you believe needs to be solved, and you have to get some feel for if you solve this problem, is there going to be somebody who would buy this? Perfect. So one question, one follow-up question before we move to Deepak. Rajiv, you tried the first time Ingrian Networks, and you put a lot of effort, and a lot of people sometimes do that. They get into the first company, they try it. In a way, it did not work the way you wanted it to, you know. And you left. Did you have any feelings at that time that maybe, you know what, let me take a break, go back to a full-time job for a few years, let the market turn around, let things become a little bit better, let me have a better and a more systematically aligned uh, plan before I come back and start a company. I mean, you just right away went into it. And a lot of people have a lot of fear doing that. That's another kind of fear that people need to overcome. Would you like to comment upon that a little bit? Absolutely. So, so it's not, so, so Ingrian systems actually, or Ingrian networks, had no impact of the bust. In fact, it stayed on. Uh, it got acquired by SafeNet sometime in 2007 or 8 time frame. So, so it's not that there was an impact and I left. It's just that, and I, again, unless you do it, it's hard to explain, and I'll be happy to talk offline if you're really in this situation. So this, when we hired the CEO, there were difference of opinion. And once you reach a stage where you realize it's better for me to be out than be part of the company. Even though you, know, you build the company from ground up, uh, the, the, earlier, the earliest year, years are the hardest years because you're building the product, you're trying to do the validation. So if you enjoy slogging, join early on. If you, if you want to be a little bit easier and still benefit, again, you have to def look at your profile and see what fits you, then join a little later stage. Uh, so the reason I left is because there was a difference of opinion. And at that time, actually, I did consider going and joining a company. But again, there's that HR look. Working two and a half years, you, it's your culture, the way you wanted to shape the product, the way you want to do things, that seemed the right way of doing things. So actually, when we started Neopath Networks, there were four founders. And one of the, again, this goes back to your risk profile. So the funding was not easy. We actually took us four, five months before we raised our Series A. So one of the founders had put this, look, you have to be pretty honest with each other. If we don't close the Series, of, series A of funding, he was going to go back to a full-time job because he needed a paycheck. So again, you have to look at your situation and decide. And we got lucky. I mean where we were able to close and the founders stuck around. So the, the thought does cross your mind, but you have to look at your risk profile and say, look, I thought if this fails, I could always find a job. So why not? Makes sense. So, so Yeah, good. So uh, let's now me, uh, move to Deepak. So uh, your case is slightly different from most of the people in Silicon Valley. You were not in Silicon Valley, if I'm correct. You were as far from Silicon Valley as you can get. <laughs> A deep respect for Detroit, Michigan. But you're in Ford, already a successful uh, you know, professional, CFO of a major part of Ford as a company. You could have continued there. And you, know, you could have either worked for Ford or the other big companies, and could have probably you know, even grown up to a, to a higher ladder in the executive career. And then you took a decision to come to Silicon Valley. Right now, looking back, you know, Tesla 
seems like a no brainer at that time when you took the decision electric cars were still a good concept a great concept uh, from you know scientific perspective commercial <coughs> success we're still struggling with it but you did take a chance you know you left a well paying stabless job uh, you know very respected one of the oldest companies in american empire ford to come to silicon valley to work for tesla you know elon musk is a great guy to work for and everything is great but hey you are you you're putting a lot of things you know online and uh, you jumped the ship what motivated you at that time because that time it was not like a 2000 gold rush in silicon valley It's 2008 the financial crisis was kind of imploding you know silicon valley was still recovering to some extent from the dot com bust you're getting into an area which was an area tesla kind of defines its own industry so there was no much of you know peer example or you know some kind of what i call silicon valley uh, the nostalgia that you get in there it was very different what motivated you to take that plunge we'd love to hear from you yeah, well, firstly uh, uh, it's my honor to be here and a pleasure thank you uh, to be speaking to uh, bhu friends and feels like family i'm really impressed to see the number of people uh, who are here and, and you're right that um, I mean, in the company of Jagdish and Rajiv, uh, who are true Silicon Valley techies, I'm a finance guy, sort of on the dark side. We do love you, though. <laughs> 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 and I can't claim to be an entrepreneur either, unlike these two guys who have founded companies and done Series A round of funding. Uh, so it's certainly a very different story in my case. uh to to cut a long story short i would say uh while i was at ford um there was clearly no reason for me to move to california i had not visited california for about 15 years um had forgotten what california looked like and i could have never imagined moving to california <coughs> and um one um <coughs> Odd day, got a call from a recruiter who was trying to find a CFO for Tesla Motors, and uh, got talking, and uh, one thing led to another. Um, had an interview um, with Elon Musk, um, and Elon at that time was not a known entity for sure. In fact, his reputation was pretty negative um, at that time. And um, while he was a successful entrepreneur, uh, obviously he had done PayPal. and um, started spacex but nobody knew spacex uh, either and we sort of hit it off and he asked me to come meet him in la uh, two days later he said just fly i want to meet you and met him in la um he had the only tesla roadster that tesla had at that time <laughs> um and um spent about you know several hours talking to him and came back and it was certainly a fork in the road for me I could have um, continued a very reasonably successful, let's say, career. I uh, lived a decent life in a very low cost of living area in Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> no, you certainly uh, don't miss the seven degree weather anymore. I, that is true. <laughs> yes, that is true. Um, and I had two teenage daughters going to high school um, at that point, uh, who were well settled. But I think two considerations at the end of the day made me. uh take that leap of faith um the first one was that if i if i sort of put myself ahead 15 years further and and let's say i'm 60 65 and i retired from ford um the thought was had i really exploited my full potential as a human being had i really fully challenged myself um and i could not give myself a very strong affirmation or yes to that question um and the other aspect was uh meeting elon made me realize that he's truly a unique man who had the capability if anyone else did in this world to transform the automotive industry in a way that's never been even dreamt of uh the the meeting with him and his vision was uh, truly inspirational of what he wanted to do with the electric um, car and with the whole car buying experience and building our own stores and our own service um, and the vertical integration of our manufacturing it's amazing that he had that vision and that game plan laid out uh in those early days 
And so I took that leap of faith and so between, uh, jumped. So between 2008 and 2010, yep. those two years, any time did it struck up you? Maybe I thought I've been in, you know, with Ford and not come here. Uh, many, many times. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about one of them. <laughs> many times. I made sure I did not break my relationships at Ford. And I Good kept idea. calling them on a regular basis. <laughs> Good career advice. <laughs> <laughs> and I kept my house in Michigan for a while. So Smart financial move. Up. That's right. Because, uh, yeah, I, mean, I joined Tesla in 2008, July. And... Um, in September of 2008, as, all, as you all know, the market collapsed, and um, those were the dark, dark days, um, uh, you know, another nuclear winter, okay. so to say. And Tesla was in the process of closing on a $100 million Series E round at that time, which completely fell apart. Um, and it meant that we had to completely redesign our business plan. We let, we, we let go 30% of our workforce at that time. I figured maybe I'll, let, I'll be let go to, it made sense. Why, why have a um, high paid CFO when you, don't, you know, no, don't need it? I somehow survived that. And um, we, we went through a period where it felt like payroll won't be met next week. And there was no funding and uh, uh, Mr. Musk was uh, funding the company from his own pocket. You tell your family about that? Um, not personal, just general question. I actually did not, uh, because that would have made them, you know, pretty upset, and I had to keep that even away from my wife, uh, quite frankly. But I, I, I was prepared to move within a week if, you know, Tesla blew up and could have happened. And, and um, you know, I'm sure both Jagdish and Rajiv can claim or, or can identify to this that in the success of, on the path of success of any company, there are many, many existential threats that come on the way. Uh, and sometimes they feel they are coming on a daily basis and sometimes weekly or quarterly, but they are always there. Um, and um, the ability to survive through that is what's really a part of being a successful entrepreneur. At the end of the perfect, day. perfect. So before we, you know, I, we certainly all, everybody wants to always know, and we'll leave it for the end to tell us, uh, Deepak, when you know the future financial plan for Tesla and your <laughs> net income <laughs> and stuff. But we'll not. This is this is not an analyst conference, trust me. So before we move to the next question, I want to open it to the audience, and I'll take the mic to the person. Questions that you have that you might be thinking of asking somebody, but never got the right person to ask. Start with yes. my. <coughs> Yeah, <coughs> start with you. Just introduce yourself real quickly and then. Uh, my name is Subhash Chaudhary. And uh, so I've been to Detroit, uh, the other company with two letters, GM. And uh, in the meeting there, uh, they did not believe Tesla would exa exist. Was that the same attitude in Ford also? Certainly. Um, to start a car company, is incredibly difficult. Um, there has been no successful American car company in the last 100 years almost. And then to make it an electric car company in California that's vertically integrated in its manufacturing and wants to challenge the dealership network and do its own sales and service, that's an incredibly hard thing to take on. And, and I would say it was only in the last couple of years that uh, not just the American car makers, but even the Japanese or German car makers are beginning to at least consider us with a bit more seriousness. Can't say completely yet, but... Yeah. There was one question here, Prafal. Thanks, Shah. Um, thank you very much. This was pretty insightful. Uh, you, you mentioned the existential moments in every startup, and I can see the smile, and I'm sure entrepreneurs in this room have faced that. And then there's this concept of lean startups, right? It's very kind of uh, popular in Silicon Valley where the whole idea is to quickly adapt and quickly take market feedback. And to me, these two things are contradictory. To, to go through an existential crisis in your career or, or, or a company's life and to try and respond to, because clearly at that existential point, the market is not endorsing your ideas. So what, what advice do you have for young entrepreneurs on how to reconcile these two seemingly counterintuitive concepts. Uh, 
So I don't think they are two different things. So if you think about at least my understanding of lean startup and the models I have seen, the whole idea is that you want to reach a stage where you have an understanding of, you now a lot of people talk about product market fit. So if you look, I didn't even know that word when we were doing Neopath Networks, but it was common sense and we went and said, okay, Broadcom, would you buy this? So you're trying to get to that product market fit. So the notion there is you want to reach that product market fit as soon as possible in your journey because then you're not burning cash. Ultimately, look, you're looking at your, if, if, if you're just doing it on your own money, then again, it's your risk profile. How long can you continue this journey before you make it a business? So Lean Startup is about the model of figuring that out. An existential crisis which happens is, well, during that journey, you're going to sooner or later, if you are funding it yourself, or whether it's the money from the VCs, the money is going to not last forever. And uh, look, I was smiling because, you know, if I could just say this, we had this experience only at Ingrian. So we went through this existential crisis at Ingrian many times in my stay for two and a half years. Neopath, you know, we raised three rounds of funding before getting acquired by Cisco. We went through this experience many, many times over. And at Cloud Relox, we recently closed a new round of funding, but before that, you always go through these cycles and you have to figure out, are you, look, if you run out of cash, it's game over, right? <coughs> so this is the, I hope that's what you meant by existential crisis. That's one aspect of it. There are others. Yes, there are. So, I'm, yeah. so, so from doing the company, you want to make sure the lean model is so you can conserve your cash so you can, you can last long to figure out what you're trying to do. So why don't you come in on the other yeah, aspects? Deepak, yeah. Go ahead. Deepak, please. Yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. Okay, so you know, only one point there, I think. That's, uh, I would say, you know, similar experience. Uh, you know, I've probably gone through an ex existential crisis many, many times through even current company, previous company. Um, it, it, that's one thing that's constant, right? And that's what keeps you honest and straight. Um, because you always have to balance that. But, you know, one of the advice I've kind of taken to heart uh, from some of the advisors from early on was, for, especially for startups, right? If you're going to fail, fail fast, right? Because you, you, you want to make sure that, you know, it relates to that product market fit. You're constantly experimenting, right? You're constantly experimenting who's going to buy this, Am I building an aspirin or a white man, right? What pain point you're solving? Are there enough people who have the same pain point? These are all questions that you're constantly asking. The sooner you get to answer those questions, you know, you'll reach the tipping point. At that point, you can kind of choose. You know it's going to take off. Now, then, then, it's, then it's a question of management and, and, and different aspects come in. But until then, you are going to be burning cash, right? And you're going to make investments that are bad. You're going to make... Uh, uh, you know, decisions that may not be right, right? So I, I think that's when those things happen, right? Because you don't have investors who truly believe in that, right? And it's hard to raise money. It's hard to raise, in, uh, so you, you are in this constant um, cycle where you're trying to attract money, but you really don't have all the fundamentals worked out yet. So it's hard for an investor to appreciate that and, and confidently invest. And you're going to run into this existential uh, crisis. But I think the key is, to be able to um, just accept it and embrace it and just, you know, you, you have to keep your uh, eye on that single thing that, you know, Rajiv talked about, which is try to find that <coughs> answer to that. Of course, you do what you need to do tactically to conserve cash so that you have enough runway to get answers to that. Uh, because once you get that answer, the rest will work itself out. But if you don't find that answer, it doesn't matter. You may raise some money, but it's just going to be a slow death. So. And Deepak, we're going to make the question a little bit tougher for you. It's not just about succeeding. You need to also succeed at a large enough, enough to also have a cash flow positive scenario. And that continues even if you've gone through an IPO. Yeah, you want to, uh, yeah. so sorry. Which, which so the, the, we have tried to make the question tougher for you. So <laughs> same question, yeah. existential crisis, but yeah. here you've already gone through an IPO, yeah. and still the business financial model is still getting innovated. Oh, yeah. And you know, so I want to hear from you about that. Yeah, I mean, I think... Um, 
Uh, IPO is just a milestone in the journey. It's not the end at all. In fact, it just makes life difficult because you're in the public eye and you've got to now start delivering in every quarter, which is quite, a, quite painful, I must admit, <laughs> compared to, um, uh, you know, having slightly longer term strategy and vision and having hopefully the right investors who go along with that ride. Um, I mean, in the case of Tesla, uh, the reason we went public, and uh, that's also sometimes important for companies to know what that exit strategy is. For us, an IPO was not an exit strategy. For us, that was the best way to get capital at the lowest cost possible by going to the public markets. An automotive company is asset intensive. We knew we needed billions of dollars and there was no VC in the valley who was going to give us even 100 million because they're just not used to funding in a brick and mortar company like Tesla. So that was the only reason we went public, knowing that it came with a lot of pain in terms of disclosures, in terms of visibility, and so forth. Um, it was the right strategy for us. It also helped us build our brand. Uh, the challenge in terms of existential uh, threats certainly did not stop because uh, where it's still not necessarily off from your product is, in the case, I'll, I'll give you a few examples, um, your technology perhaps doesn't work. It's still the right product, but you're not ready. Um, the time to get the product to market is longer. Uh, in our case, uh, we had both of those issues. And to compound it, we had this super aggressive production ramp. We thought we'll go from zero cars to 400 cars a week in six months, or we could barely touch 200. So dealing with that, you know, that becomes an existential crisis yes. for you because your revenue is not coming, costs are piling up. So those challenges, quite frankly, don't stop. And... Um, I don't think they're over for Tesla, quite frankly. There's still a big path ahead of us.